everyone. It's uh, Alex Timlin, Senior Vice President of Industry, Security Masters, and uh, very much delighted to be joined all the way from uh, Mexico City by Carlos Roberto Lopez, Director of E-Commerce and Strategic Marketing at the Home Depot. Carlos, thank you so much for making time and, uh, and for, for sharing your insights. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex, and the whole team from MRCs uh, to, for having us uh, and be able to talk about our experiences regarding omni-channel strategies. I think this is one of the sessions I've genuinely have been looking forward to the most uh, from speaking to the team, because I think there's, there's so many different pieces involved. And what we're going to do throughout this session is just ask uh, Carlos a, a few questions that are going to help unpack some of the things that he and his team have been doing over a number of years, rather than focusing on some of the quick gimmicky things that a lot of people are looking about what happened throughout 2020. I think everyone's kind of got a good understanding of the, the landscape and the big changes, but I think having a look at deliberate long-term strategies and deliberate changes within a business is it probably something that we haven't spent enough time on Adi Masters nor in the community as well. And wanted to take this opportunity to, to speak to Carlos about just culturally how his team and how the business operates for, for Home Depot in Mexico. And congratulations on being the sixth largest retailer in, uh, in, in all of Mexico in such a booming economy. And uh, what I'd like to do now is to just ask a few questions, go through and, and have you explain a little bit about, uh, less about just the technology, but the more the people in the process around how you guys have been trading so effectively uh, in, in what's been a very challenging time. So for, for the first question, and this one's, I think, a, a, a good foundation for some of the topics we're going to be looking at throughout the session is uh, really about how the Home Depot has achieved 20 consecutive years of positive, positive growth and has always been focused on an interconnected retail experience. And it does seem that you've been doing something right that a lot of other people have struggled with. And I think one of the things you mentioned in the, the kind of pre-meeting chats and prep, which has really resonated with us, is uh, the three-legged stool strategy, which has kind of been codified into the business. It would be great to understand how that's impacted your decision-making and your leadership and how it's helped you run an effective digital strategy for the team. Perfect. Uh, sure, Alex. Uh, let, let me talk a little bit about... Uh, where does the, the Trilex tool uh, business uh, model strategy comes from? So this comes all the way down to our founders, uh, Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, that they uh, decided to put a very simple, uh, seems basic uh, icon for our business model and, and our strategy uh, where we use a Trilex tool uh, with uh, three different but very integrated concepts uh, on the same time. So one of them is uh, we will talk about customer experience. Then we will talk about productivity. And then we will talk about product authority. So in, in each of them, uh, we have had for years uh, a focus on uh, taking care of our associates and our customers so we can provide a better customer experience at the stores, traditional stores then selling more per square feet. That's the biggest question on productivity and also uh, delivering a return on investment above the average, obviously. And then having the best brands, the best pricing strategy, the best price, everyday low price for our customers. That's what we talk about product authority. But then imagine when we start uh, in mexico ba back in 2014 we have to put together as you said a long-term strategy for where where do we want to go uh regarding our online roadmap or an online business roadmap so we say you know what i mean whatever we do it must roll up to our to our highest level of 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 thinking in terms of strategy of the business so why don't we take the same approach of the Trilex tool and put it for us to, to, to work in, in the online business? So we decided to go with customer experience and decided that uh, we will do whatever we need to do in order to enhance our shopping experience during the website. So online merchandising in the website, navigation in the website, user experience on our website, different payment methods, uh, going to uh, having today the more uh, the most robust portfolio of alternative payment methods, uh, delivery of the products 
that's in our experience. So we put together all those all, all the initiatives around this in order to provide the greatest online shopping experience. So that's how we translated that. Uh, then we moved to product authority. And this is something more straightforward. So regarding product authority, we already have the brands, we already have the best prices, uh, quality in our products. So what about the extended bay, the endless aisle, how, how some, some out there call it. So let's, let's see if we can improve home improvement uh, proposal uh, in our stores by including in our website catalog more products that what we carry at the stores. And on the other side, uh, how can we provide the more robust information for our customers to take decisions, purchase decisions, having how, how to, how to uh, install uh, our products, uh, uh, so on and so forth. And the other part was productivity. How do we do more with the same or better? How do we do more with less? So how can we convert more? And that's uh, a conversion rate optimization talk, probably a different topic. So that's how we translate that. So anytime, and this is a very, a very important tip for anyone trying to put together out there their online business strategy. When you go with your management team, your top management team, and try to explain things just out of the wild uh, based on, on, on technology topics or whatever that they don't are very familiar with, you're going to struggle with it. But if you put that under, under what's known for them, uh, having the analogy of your core strategy, business strategy, I think that's something that will resonate on their brains and, and you'll get a, a lot of buying uh, with that. So putting these three together, that's what we uh, now call the interconnected retail uh, strategy in our business. And I so, think that's a really important lesson just to, to pick up on that one bit for, for giving people some coaching around how they get investment into new initiatives, into teams and into the way things come is don't come at them with what you know about digital and e-commerce and about the shiny new objects. Look at how your function and how these new initiatives will contribute towards clearly defined and already established business goals. And the responsibility of, of a good leader is to translate some of the complexity in the digital and e-commerce landscape into simplicity to say, here's how it's going to help us with an overall business outcome. And here's how it's going to provide a better experience to a customer. And I think that's a, a really important point for us to capture before we kind of move on to, to some other topics. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly the, the case, Alex. And uh, it is because at the end of the day, uh, you are in a retail industry. So the basics are still the basics. And that's important to not to forget, right? Yeah, 100%. And I think the the key thing about that, again, there are the basics and other complexities. And I think for, for a lot of people, seeing the, the gradual and deliberate change of Home Depot in both the US, Canada, and especially in Mexico, from the perception of being a traditional kind of brick and mortar retailer into being a brand that has actually for a very long time lived and breathed this kind of omni-channel retail piece that other people have been talking about only just recently, has really proven of, of exactly where these 20, 20 consecutive years of growth has coming from it's a, a deliberate strategy to serve the customers to be efficient to be effective uh, through all of the channels you trade as and when they come and and be where your customers are if you could do it all again though are there certain things that you've learned on your journey of, of launching the brand in a new market and, and really helping shape what digital means that you would maybe do differently or advice you could give to other people who are are in similar roles in large businesses launching new digital initiatives after the, the piece of last year that could help them think about how they get better buy-in from leadership and better results for their business? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So let me tell you that... Uh, we were lucky. We were lucky uh, the, back in 2014. Uh, remember that we're talking about Mexico, uh, right? So in Mexico, we started, I mean, the, the whole industry is started a, a little bit late with uh, omni-channel uh, projects and initiatives, especially big box uh, retailers, traditional retailers. But we were lucky that we have our, our partners in Home Depot US and Home Depot Canada uh, as partners and advisors. So 
my very, very first uh, advice to everyone out there uh, starting with this journey is don't try to invent the wheel. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of road already uh, created uh, that you can take leverage on. So that's, that's what we did. Uh, and it, it got us at that time, we're talking about seven years, seven to eight years ago. It got us to be uh, at that time uh, going the other way around in terms of operation of our e-commerce strategy uh, of, of what other retailers were doing. Uh, and why is that? I mean, so right now, and, and, and a lot of you out there are trying to integrate your, your stores, physical stores, if you are a traditional retailer, uh, to the e-commerce world. So you get to what we're calling now the, the omni-channel uh, business. But we started from scratch with, with an inter integrated uh, or interconnected retail experience. So we offer buy online pickup in store since 2014. So we integrated the store inventory. Uh, we, can, we could deliver since then, uh, deliver uh, from the stores direct to customers' home. So that allowed us to, uh, to be uh, faster in delivering uh, most of the home improvement product mix that we have in our stores. So th the, the retail industry was going the other way around. They were uh, building uh, distribution centers, especially for online. They have a separate division for, for the online business. Imagine that. So what we did is our team internally I mean, the marketing functions were, were in the marketing function, but we had online people in there, merchandising, supply chain, IT, and all that. So we created also an interconnected team inside the company. So we were not a different division. We were not competing again against our stores, that that was something that happened in the industry. And so that, that goes directly to a bad customer experience. Because sometimes uh, store associates were trying to sabotage the, the online operation because they say, hey, that's not going to count for my bonus or whatever. So that's another reason why interconnected uh, operations are so important. So we, had, we were that lucky to have that advice. Uh, U.S. was just starting in that point. They were just starting to integrate with their stores too. Uh, so, but that, that uh, came out with a price and that's what we uh, would do differently. So the price was, we were so focused on having this running smoothly in an in a an hundred percent automated way, end to end the process, which is a very, very difficult task, more than 20 systems needed to be integrated and all that. So we were so caught up with that, that we forgot a little bit about extending our product mix on the website and capturing and monetizing our website a little bit better. So that's something that we've been uh, uh, putting together and catching up since last year. We're doing a terrific job right now, but that's something that uh, we will be uh, thinking of that we had had doing uh, differently. And, and th th that takes me to another tip uh, related to this that at that time you have so much things to do. Uh, anyone that is under uh, this journey has a lot of different initiatives, is hearing each day you read news of new technology, new platforms, a lot of vendors trying to sell you things, solutions or whatever, uh, and, and it's overwhelming. And it will be overwhelming the amount of things that you need to think about strategic wise. So, I think having a dedicated team, project management initiatives and a strategy team just for this omni-channel journey going forward at that time uh, will have uh, helped me a lot in order to be prioritizing better or initiatives, not losing time in some of the different uh, areas that you need to consider. So that's another uh, advice that I will give to, to anyone out there trying to put this together. Uh, have a dedicated team 
because that will give you a lot of time to focus on the really important for long-term strategies. Uh, that will be, yeah. Alex. I think for, for colleagues in marketing and in commerce roles, I think this is where the, the, the biggest lesson that I hear from colleagues, both in businesses large and small, particularly with, with kind of the clients where you have a more, a more strategic relationship with where we're, we're very much working closely with them, is the understanding the complexity in the business as to why things don't happen. I think sometimes we get frustrated in digital teams or commerce teams about wanting to move fast and wanting to get things forward and not understanding those 50, 60, 70 different systems and those hundreds of processes that need to change to be able to happen. And that requires process management, change management and, and buy-in to be able to get things done. So treating things as a, an ongoing uh, process and looking at things not as projects that you start and finish, but small yeah. things that is an incremental delivery, small bite-sized chunks that get you to an end goal is fantastic advice. I think one of the things that you did talk about there that is, is something I'm hearing more and more from retailers is, is something that I think is worth expanding on, which is the, the extension of the catalog. And as you say, a lot of people replicate what's been successful for them in stores in online and they miss the opportunity to test and learn. And I think one of the things you were talking about there about the, the product range we're seeing in fashion clients and, and other categories as well of being able to say, how can I test new brands or different products using the digital property to start figuring out what might be good in stores? And yeah. similarly, how do I look at what's working well in stores to test and learn in the, in the, in the digital world? And I think being able to take risks is a huge advantage of digital. And I think building those partnerships between different teams, particularly the merchandising teams, is something that a lot of people haven't done well enough in the e-commerce world when we're focused on conversion rate optimization, payment methods, checkout, security, fraud, and, and everything else that goes in it because it's it's complex enough. So I think there's a there's a huge amount of stuff there that, that people can hopefully learn from and uh, I think is representative to, of what we hear from uh, from a lot of different people. But if we just kind of switch gears a little bit and, and talk about some of the, the recent progress you've been making around this better integration of online and offline and the lessons you've learned about what's working really well, how is your approach to integrating online and offline data sources and this, this rich DNA in having kind of integrated retail uh, throughout Home Depot in Mexico affected your approach to customer experience and personalization? So, uh, and, and this is, this is what, what you were saying about uh, incremental uh, deliverables, right? So right now we're, we're doing, uh, we, we started uh, uh, several years ago, but right now this is an evolving topic. When you talk about data management, uh, personalization, automation, this is ever evolving uh, topic. Each year, new things. So when we think uh, in an interconnected shopping experience, so we believe in, in Home Depot, we believe that this, this has to, to cover the entire journey, right? So from the awareness and inspiration uh, to providing a specific product know-how uh, to how we are communicating with your customers, we are investing in, in a lot of different areas. Infrastructure capabilities needed to deliver the most relevant marketing messages, but also the product and value proposition for our customers at the right time. So uh, this is not, not easy, not easy at all. So uh, to be honest, but we've been doing, uh, uh, some some progress in here. So we have integrated uh, several data sources across the company. Believe me, again, this is far, far as an easy thing, uh, but this is a must. So you need, you need to, to invest time on that. So we've been using this uh, integration uh, through a Marsis suite, uh, which with the team here, uh, with the Marsis has, has helped a lot in order to mapping all the different fields in the databases. So we integrated sources like invoicing system. Uh, we integrated uh, the CRM for our pro customers, professional customers. We integrated the website, obviously, newsletter, the blog that we have, inspirational blog, uh, social networks, so on and so forth. So we've been using this to deliver personalized product offering in different channels. So with the help of, uh, of the suite the, of Marsis, we can put this 
uh, personalization efforts out there on our emails, on our uh, website, uh, on Facebook and Google with uh, CRM ads uh, feature. So uh, that's how we've been approaching for the last uh, probably three, uh, three, two to three years. So let me let me give you one example. So this year, uh, with the help of uh, an Amarsis consultant, hey Nick. Uh, thanks, thanks for everything, by the way. Uh, and, and also using the Smart Insights solution from Amarsis, we put together an automated slash segmented campaign within the platform that considers complexity. So when I talk about complexity is, uh, imagine you need to cross the customer life cycle that the, the, the tool or the platform gives you customer website behavior, the product category they're interested in, and another, uh, whatever other key uh, uh, data or attributes you need to put in there in order to trigger automated workflows that are relevant to a specific segment or customer. So that, that's complex. But uh, when you have a tool uh, like Amaris's uh, suite, you have, you have uh, a lot of, uh, of the job, the, the complex job, it's to program it and put it into the platform. But that needs brain power behind planning and all that, that it's not automated. I mean, you don't click in a button and do that. So you need a, a, a strategy behind, but once you have the strategy, go to the platform and configure it there and let it, let it go. Uh, that's the easy part. So that's how we're using the offline data together with the online data. And we are now able to provide, for example, different emailing campaigns to different segments of customers, but it's just one effort from, from the, the team that is doing one campaign. We change a little bit some of the parts of the communication based on what the algorithms are learning about that specific customers. So that's one way of doing that. Uh, Another way we're using this is, as I said before, we have this B2B business, which is very important for Home Depot, the, the online for pros experience. Uh, we also plugged in into the marketing automation platform. So we integrated the CRM information where we have a catalog of the segment of the particular customer. So this is a contractor for plumbing. This is a contractor for paint. This is an architect. So when you have that and you have their sales, you can verify their segments and then tweak the product mix that you are delivering and the messages, the key messages that you are delivering, uh, again, in email, SMS communication, or, or even in the website with the product recommendation carousel. So that's the efforts that we're doing right as of today, uh, but it, it doesn't end in there. So since last year, we've been working intensively on developing a, a customer data strategy. So this is a more holistic thing because uh, we need to take into account all the transactions from the store, right? So there's a lot of information that's going out there. So we need to get that data. So to scale personalization, we must go another uh, level further because first party data as any digital marketer out there now this year knows better than than a couple of years ago first Thank party you, data it's more important than ever so there's where a, a a customer data platform enters the equation so to be honest we are still developing that again we reach out to the us we reach out to canada home depot partners in there see what they're doing and now we're focusing on going another level so we have done this for online uh we want to to be able to push this personalization out to the stores. So imagine the impact that we will have in there. And I think that's the key thing. And you've said it a lot. I think there's a lot of talk about kind of customer data platforms and, and different technology pieces, but you're only as good as your strategy. And I think a lot of people underestimate the difference between, you know, how do I deal with web events and how do I deal with different pieces there with, how do I deal with 
some things that are attributed to invoices? How do I deal with some things that are attributed to certain parts of a business that I've never heard of? And most of the people that we're dealing with just underestimate the complexity when it looks at their entire customer experience landscape rather than just a kind of digital communications landscape. And I think some of the things that you guys have done really well is just being honest about the challenges and kind of practical about the opportunities to say, how do we use what we do know as a foundation to get that buy-in for those bigger projects, which is how do I start working not just with the traditional, what people would call customer data, the stuff living in a CRM, but looking at orders, looking at products, looking at inventory, looking at availability, promoting things that are in stock to people who are interested in it is a great place to start of building results that deliver a better experience for the customer and a better experience for the business and helps people on that path and that journey to getting a little bit more customer centric in their stores and with their store associates, not just with a website. And I think there are, there are very few uh, leaders as brave as yourself to be able to say, how do I take digital to stores, not just take sales from stores and replicate them online. And I think that's a, a key topic of looking at where these kind of I'm not a big fan of digital transformation as a term. I think it's been uh, 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 adopted and utilized in places yeah. that it doesn't belong, but you guys have actually truly been on a digital transformation journey and, and done it well. But one of the things people don't talk about outside of the, the normal, it's complex, it's this, that, and the other is the, the upside. And I think productivity is a topic that you've looked at and talked about previously that I think is really important to say, how do some of these new initiatives and these new kind of ways of approaching data and data-driven marketing and advertising really look at how the team works, how they're structured, and, and how has it had an impact on what you're doing? So productivity as a result of automation, how has that really affected the way that you and the teams operate? Yeah, that, that's right. Um... And, and it, just to, to complement on, on, on your question. So it is important uh, for, for, for a business to understand also when is productivity efforts uh, really, really a, a, a focus uh, on, on topic. So why, why? Because I mean, normally when you are in a mature industry or uh, struggling a little bit, not growing or whatever, productivity, it's, it's more, way more important, right? But when you're starting something, sometimes we lose track of productivity. We just want things to be implemented, executed. So in this case, uh, imagine in our industry, uh, any a multi-category retailer, I mean, we need to manage fragmented customer segments and a huge variety of product categories, thousands and thousands of SKUs, sometimes hundreds or thousands of categories. So you create, for example, some automation uh, with, uh, within this uh, effort that we were talking before, and you get great results. Then what's next? You need to replicate that because you have fragmented customers and, and a lot of product categories, right? So, but then uh, when, when you are uh, getting uh, on track with this effort, you have the strategy, you put together that strategy for a particular segment or for a particular category, you get the results, you like them, so you start replicating. Uh, then the design team, imagine you have a pool of designers, Personalizations, when we are not talking about uh, the very product at the product level, some banners, banners that can be done automatically now with technology. But this product, this always, price, it's very transactional. Yeah, that's transactional. But but at the end of the day, there's also an effort, you, uh, art and science, right? Designers need to be creating different experiences, visual experiences or whatever. So once you start uh, freeing them from time, they start creating more experiences for more customer segments or more categories. So the online merchandising planning team uh, that plans for these experiences across the workflows that you can create in a marketing automation platform, that's the brain power behind it. Uh, there's a, a point in time where you're going to end uh, or complete your portfolio. The work, it's almost done and the tool it's automating so then you start the productivity of the team starts ramping now 
exponentially. Why? Because they can uh, be focused on analyzing uh, the, the profitability of each of the campaigns. They can do uh, more maintenance to those campaigns, focus on seasonal events, pushing a little bit some of the messages inside the automated workflow. So it is a matter of not only how can you save some time from your uh, actual team, but how can you do more things with the same with the same thing? So that's an exponential thing uh, a long time once you start uh, working with automation. And at the end of the day, I mean, this is a game of growing the lifetime value of your customers, right? In all channels. So the only way customers demonstrate loyalty is by incrementing their frequency their tickets with you or whatever. So without data, uh, personalization efforts or automation, it is almost impossible to provide them relevant uh, and a great customer experience where they are shopping with you or where they go to your website to look for whatever information they need and then go to a store. Doesn't matter where they buy, just they buy it from you, right? So this is where productivity comes around. So the, the tool, uh, it, it, helps you uh, to have a more productive team that can uh, tackle more initiatives when they are, they are, once they are uh, already covered the, the current and the basic customer segments and product categories, experiences they already created. And I think that's back to the, the three-legged stool strategy of making sure you've got the right balance of both domain expertise, so the authority around the product, the use, the education in your marketing messaging, as well as the price and promotion piece around that, that, that product authority and the, the experiences about those two things coming together. And I think what you talked about there is such a powerful thing where sometimes people automate and forget. And I think even culturally kind of some some marketing salespeople and, and so on are guilty of just saying, look, it's fire and forget. But it's like, that's, that's a terrible experience for a customer. It's, you need to identify the category. You can identify the segments, but you need to then think about the copy, the imagery, the treatment layer, everything that goes around it. Because if you're a Home Depot, if you're talking about kitchens, it's a very, very different conversation to talking about plumbing supplies or cement. Like you can't just change the product and have everything else miraculously just work in the same way. There's a real balance of that art and science, as you say, that goes into to looking at how to be relevant for the end customer within that category and within that context. And I think that category experience is specifically something that you guys have done really well across not just business to consumer, but for the professionals, the contractors, the architects, the plumbers, and the, the people who are there out buying to then work on projects for the end consumer. How does that relationship with a contractor or with the kind of a, a professional differ from the normal customer? And what advice would you give to other multi-category, multi-channel retailers in, in how to manage the complexity of uh, dealing with a consumer, but also dealing with a, a professional buyer at the same time? Okay. Uh... Alex, as, as I said before, uh, last year, and this is something uh, quite uh, new uh, for us. And uh, give me a minute. So Alexa, Alexa, just turn it on. We will need to edit that. It's okay. My watch does the same thing occasionally. It, yeah. it overhears so, me and then so just that's, talking. That's because me. you are Alex, right? So he said, <laughs> she said Alexa. So. Uh, you can you can put this Dakota on the on the on the how do you say the bloom the the bloopers, the bloopers. yeah Whatever. yeah uh, yeah so as I told before we we'll, we launched a year ago uh, so this is a fresh and new uh, platform we we call it uh, the online for pros experience uh, so it is an extended site uh, from our or traditional or, or DIY as uh, we call do it yourself customer or B two C platform so it's a, an extended site and, and why is that because uh, we have con big constructors contractors renovators remodelers architects property managers so those are professional customers so they have a different purchase behavior than than the do-it-yourself customers right so if you go to this uh, website you will find a uh, same structure or layout but you'll have a, a different uh, or personalized for pros experience. 
So you have more information on your account where we show the information we have in our CRM. Uh, we have a customer specific tier pricing for them. So customer A don't get the same price as customer B. Uh, we have quick order and, and quoting capabilities. We have uh, different payment methods like pay on delivery or uh, credit payment options, for example. So uh, what we did is to emulate and leverage first the offline and traditional purchase journey from these type of customers and convert it to digital. So that, that was our starting point. Uh, and we did a lot of research and say, what's, what's valued from, from this type of customer? What's value to them? So no surprise, time is money for them. Uh, when you do a promise of delivery, it's a promise, big thing. So again, basic things, customer service, right? So uh, an advice when you're dealing with B2B is think about that. So it is a more transactional uh, operation probably uh, because they know what they want. Normally they know their product SKU numbers. They know the, the brands, the quality. There's not a lot of research they will do, but it is an opportunity to increase uh, the value of the portfolio if you carry multi categories. So uh, being aware of the type of, pro of projects they are undergoing right now helps you to promote different categories and increase the basket size, obviously, but also they see that as, as a service. So it is a service that you're selling me more things because I didn't know that you carry this type of paint or this type of power tools, right? So it is service at the end of the day. So my advice will be uh, any, anyone trying to go through the B2B uh, online business is to think about time is money for them. So this is a, a productivity game for us. This platform is not just about selling more. It's just uh, about how we can increase productivity on both sides, customers and also our sales force and operation. Provide your customers time-saving capabilities, a better customer service experience, a self-service experience if possible. And on the other side, help your sales force to better serve their customers. Uh, so they can have a, a better selling experience. That goes around again to the buy-in of your initiatives. If you want a traditional sales force to, to start uh, promoting the B2B platform, online platform, you need a buy-in first from, from them. So there's a lot of another topic that you need to cover, compensation. Are, are they gonna take credit for that? So again, interconnected strategy. So this is, this is just another channel where you can serve your customers uh, focusing on productivity, but it is very important also to dedicate enough time to research their, their current journey, where are the pain points and how a digital experience for them can solve from, for those of the main pain points they have right now. So, and again, this will be an evolving thing. So right now we are kind of in phase two of our launch from, from last year. And we are going another level because again, when you, when you take the customer data, segment your different type of customers within the pro customers, we identified that we have a sm the small pros and the big pros. Each of them have different needs. So integrations with them for an e-commerce strategy are very different because in some way you're going to going all the way around B2B and some others will purchase from you as a more B2C style, just be, a, be just with their, their corresponding prices. So those again goes to, it is not a technical uh, down to the product personalization. So these are other types of more basic personalizations that sometimes we, we lose track on them because they're kind of obvious. But you need to take into account the fundamentals, the basics first for a basic customer experience, and then go and talk about the, the current personalization efforts that we're hearing that are more trying to, to sell a little bit more, taking more share of wallet, 
uh, on a mature industry, but you need to take uh, into consideration that there are basic needs that you need to cover for your customers. Exactly. It's about what the customer wants from you. So I think what, one of the key things that you talked about there is, is particularly when you're looking at the, when you have a mix of business to business and, and business to consumers, you end up even in that business to business bucket, having a mix of different types of customers. And there will be a large contractor that doesn't want to pay with a credit card. They want to pay on account. They want to pay on invoice yeah. and they want to be able to see what their lines of credit are and everything else that goes with it. They have different needs to someone who just needs a bag of nails for a project that he's been working on for the last three weeks and he just needs it right now and it's how do I make sure you have it before I come to the store is what a lot of these trade customers want to be able to do they're looking at the digital as a catalog there are yeah. other people who want you to bring it to them because they're busy and they're on the job and it's how you recognize the different needs of customers and figure out how to reduce friction and provide better utility rather than just a nice front end or a nice layout that reflects your commerce experience for customers. I think it's, it's really good advice for people to say, while the business might want to have a consistent look and feel across different types of things, you need to remember that payment methods, order volumes, and also types of product are going to be very, very different if you're buying a ton of cement versus buying a couple of screws for a DIY project. And I think one of the things that you and the team have done well is to be sensitive to that complexity of supply chain because of the category that you're in to start saying, how do we recognize the, the, the promise to deliver? Like if I'm giving you a product that's really big and really heavy, the delivery time is going to be different to a product that I've got that's really quick, really transactional, how they go. How do you guys kind of manage that complexity of being able to be you know, efficient and keep up with the expectations of a modern consumer whilst having the realities of a business that sells very big, very bulky, very heavy things, often in low quantities. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it, it, it's funny, but it comes again around to, uh, to having a real interconnected strategy. So let's take that specific example. So uh, because it is, it is a, a, a challenging topic for a supply chain team uh, because we want to deliver the fastest to the customer, but also the cheapest for us, right? And for the customer. So, and the customer, they, they want it free normally. So when I, when I said that it comes again to interconnect the strategy is because we already had an operation at the stores delivering to our product customers. So imagine if we will, if we will go and then uh, create another division for online business and all that. So I will have to, to lease my own trucks for delivery to hire different companies and all that. So what we did is as you are integrated, you are fulfilling from some of the, of the same fulfillment centers that for our traditional uh, business. So that way, it is an incremental uh, cost for us to fulfill an online order because it's the same customer. I mean, we, we don't talk about different customers. The same customer today wants to buy online and tomorrow wants to go to the store because they feel more comfortable going to the store for a particular product and the other, they just order online or because they are buying for a different city. So leveraging on, on your current structure it's very important. It's difficult, but it's it's key when you're talking about omni-channel. I mean, having a traditional business with physical facilities uh, and, the, and a, now an online store and operation, it is very important to do a, a very detailed uh, analysis of what are the key uh, triggers for cost and also for profit and say, I can leverage in here, in here, in here. Uh, so the most you can leverage on, the, on your actual and current operations, so you are using more your assets, right? And that's profitability. Uh, that's how we have been managing to do that. I mean, it's a never ending story. Now we're focusing, how are we gonna deliver next day or same day? And another uh, advice that I will give to, to your audience is, uh, and we're, living it right now is there's a lot of uh, different services for last mile supply chain uh, uh, tasks so or, or initiatives. So there are some times where, again, you don't need to invent the wheel. 
if someone is better at you on doing a specific service, you may consider to use their service at some point in time until you say, you know what, now I, I have the capacity to develop this myself. Uh, but otherwise, you won't be able to compete or to catch up. Because remember, you are a retailer doing what? We sell home improvement products. We need to find the best product, the best prices, best deals to our customers, best accessory from our store associates to our customers, best customer service. Probably you're selling, I mean, sporting goods or whatever other thing, electronics, but you are not a development company in technology. You are not a last mile service delivery company. So that's another advice. I mean, you can outsource uh, key services in order to maintain competitiveness in the industry you're in. I think that's a really good, uh, really good advice and an important bit to kind of finish on. I think too often there's too much talk in the industry about kind of the bit in the middle, like the the commerce technologies and the the headless API movement, the microservices bit, the nerdy bit in the middle around how do I squeeze that extra little increment of performance from the stuff that's already there without thinking about. Actually, a lot of the complexity in business happens in the in the back office. It, it happens in, do I have the ability to even trade this way and trade effectively? Can I deliver on that promise to the customer? Not just can I present it to the customer, but can I deliver on that promise to the customer? And I think kind of split shipments and combined shipments and working with your operations team to be able to be a predictable and profitable business, looking at not just top line growth, but protecting that bottom line as well is a, a, a trend that's very, very new to a lot of businesses. But I think ultimately it does look at coming back to that three-legged stool strategy of saying, what, what are the main pillars of what we want to do? And one of those pillars, which is consistent for everyone, which is customer experience. How do we look at the experience that the customer expects and how do we deliver that experience and actually surprise and delight them with new innovations and new utilities that aren't just shiny new objects, but are things that help provide a better service, a more digital service and a quicker, more frictional service because time's money in a business to business or a business to consumer concept, as you, as you said and, and said so well. So uh, really appreciate you making the time to talk to us, especially spending so much time and imparting so much wisdom. Uh, I definitely learned a lot and, and have a different perspective on the way things move forward and, and we do appreciate you making time for it. Before we finish, are there any key things that you'd like to expand upon for the audience or, or any things that you'd like to cover before we uh, call it a wrap? Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Alex, and, and thank you, uh, the Marsis team, for, for all the help that we've been having on, on our journey for personalization, automation, uh, and now dealing with uh, data from our customers uh, and all that. So thank, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again, Alex, for the invitation to, uh, to this uh, uh, retail revival uh, uh, event. I hope it, it is very successful. So uh, for your audience uh, and, and who is watching at this, I, I'll just say that uh, keep learning, failing fast, uh, redoing, iterate. I mean, that's, that's where we are right now. Nobody has the last uh, word or the absolute truth about this. So it is evolving. Uh, it's an evolving business. But what, one key thing, I think it applies for everything is don't lose track of the basics of your business. So it always comes around to a customer acquiring a service or a product, and they will have an experience with that service or product. So if you can sell a lot of crappy things, you will have bad reviews, right? So you need to worry about the basics first, try to cover the pain points and prioritize. So that's that's key learnings that we have had in that, these uh, last 10 years uh, journey is prioritize its key in order for you to focus because you will have always limited resources. When we talk with our partners in the US with thousands of people, they say, we don't have enough people to do everything we wanna do and, and that's, again, a never ending story. You will never have uh, a lot of, of, of the resources you may wanna have, but you still need to act, not react, right? So uh, keep that in mind uh, and try to, to map uh, visually always the basics for delivering a great customer experience and follow that. So the technology, it's the medium, to, to, that will help you accelerate some of those things. Uh, obviously, 
but uh, it's not the main objective. So that's that's the advice that I think uh, I'll give to all all of our colleagues pursuing this this strategy of uh, for interconnected retails and competing out there. What well, fantastic advice it is. So again, thank you so much for for taking the time and for for sharing your wisdom. And uh, thank you everyone for for joining and listening. I hope you found it uh, anywhere near as valuable as I have. And, uh, very much looking forward to the other sessions at Retail Revival. Uh, please tune in and make sure that you're uh, looking at them. They are live or on demand. Uh, and very much looking forward to connecting with you all again. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.